Great. Um, hello and welcome everyone to the first session of a webinar series called Intimate Archives. My name is Srila Roy and I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology at Wits University, where I lead a large research project called Governing Intimacies. Very broadly, the project seeks to build new scholarship on gender, sexuality and intimacy in India and Southern Africa. Now, like so many things in our current pandemic times, the seed of this idea came from a conference that was scheduled to take place in Mozambique last year. But of course, it wasn't possible. We had invited several scholars, activists, and cultural practitioners, mostly from the African continent, to consider the archive as a politically productive and conceptually generative space. For this webinar series, though, we've decided to expand this original remit to take the concept of the archive more capaciously, and especially to showcase new work on gender, sexuality, and intimacy on the African continent. But through the series, you'll meet scholars and activists from the Global South more broadly. We're absolutely delighted to be kicking off the series with three recently released books that we think are exemplary of the critical intellectual and political work that gender does in African studies. Indeed, we think that these three path-breaking books absolutely rethink gender uh, with resonances well beyond African studies. So I'm going to introduce you to um, the speakers in a moment. But before that, I want to introduce you to my um, partner in um, all things webinar and all things intellectually cutting edge, which is Kayo Arujo, who's currently a postdoc at Wits Weisel and has long been associated with the Governing Intimacy Project. Um, Kayo will also be taking your questions today. So if you keep them coming through using the chat function or using the Q&A button, which is, I think everyone knows this Zoom world well by now, but either way, whatever you're most comfortable with, just keep your questions coming and Kayo will collect them and put them to our speakers after they've spoken. The format will basically be that our speakers, each of our speakers will speak for no more than 15 minutes and then we'll just open, our, open it up to a, a broad discussion. Um, the session is also being recorded. Okay, so let me just move on to introducing our, introduce to you our three speakers who are going to present in the order in which I introduce them to you. Samadile Dosukan is an assistant professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the LSE. She's the author of Fashioning Post-Feminism, Spectacular Femininity in Transnational Culture and co-editor of African Luxury, Aesthetics and Politics with Mehita Ekani, who's also at WITS and in fact a part of the Governing Intimacies Project. Uh, Simi is a member of the editorial collectives for Feminist Africa and Feminist Theory. Welcome, Simi. Mm -hmm. Kemi Balago is an associate professor in the Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies and Sociology at the University of Oregon. She's the author of Beauty Diplomacy, Embodying an Emerging Nation and the co-editor of Africa Every Day, Fun, Leisure and Expressive Culture on the Continent, which is such a brilliant title. I can't wait to read that book. And finally, Jacqueline Bethel Mugui is an assistant professor of African Cultural Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her first award-winning book is Gender, Separatist Politics and Embodied Nationalism in Cameroon. And she sits on the editorial advisory boards for Feminist Africa and the Journal of Women's History. Welcome, Jacqueline Bethel. I'm sorry, I, even after asking you what how to pronounce your last name, I fear I've completely butchered it. <laughs> so, you did oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's start with Simi. Okay. Thank you very much, Lila, for the introduction and also, of course, for the invitation to be here today and to be. Um, in conversation with Jacqueline and Kemi. And thanks, Kao, for um, all the organizing and for getting us here. And thank you to the audience too. I see some names, Charmaine and others that I recognize. So it's, it's a pleasure to be in conversation today. I would say, I mean, it's a particular pleasure, I think, to be in this conversation because um, Kemi, both Kemi's work and Jacqueline's work, uh, you know, I, I've just read the two books. Uh, I've just finished re reading them. I started a few weeks ago when I first got them. But you know the, the feeling that you have of being very closely in conversation with other, um, in this case, African feminists and also you know junior scholars as well, it's it's very um, exciting, and enriching, and affirming actually. You know, it sort of made me feel like okay, I am presumably doing something worthwhile because and you know that we that we're all kind of addressing 
uh, very very similar um, very that we're seeing similar things in our in our different kind of projects and research contexts. And I mean, I think there are other there are other African feminist scholars, and again, particularly junior scholars, who I think could also have been in this conversation in the sense that are you know also doing similar work and asking similar kinds of questions. Uh, for example, Grace uh, Adeni Ogunyanki, who's at Queens, uh, some people at Vits, Mahita, as you mentioned, also Danai, and so on. So again, it's a pleasure to be here and in, to, to be in conversation. Okay, so I'm just going to speak briefly about my book, or to introduce it briefly. So the book is entitled Fashioning Post-Feminism, Spectacular Femininity and Transnational Culture. Um, and as the name implies, well, I hope the name implies, um, it's a book about young, hyper-stylized, class-privileged Nigerian women in the city of Lagos, which is where I come from, who dress in what I call a spectacularly feminine style. And by that, I mean spectacular, spectacularly feminine, mostly in a descriptive sense. Um, so it's a style of dress characterized by um, the use of heavy makeup, um, long hair extensions or uh, long weaves or wigs, uh, false nails, false eyelashes, and so on, the, the highest of heels and so on. Uh, so I, I, I use spectacular in the sense, you know, spectacular in the sense of dramatic, visible, and so on, particularly against the broader Nigerian socio social landscape. So the central question of the book um, is what kind of femininity is being performed in and through this style, or more simply put, how does this stylized subject, who I refer to as the spectacularly feminine Lagos woman, how does she see herself as what kind of self, gendered self and otherwise constituted and positioned self? So to try to answer this question or these questions, um, I conducted interviews in 2013 with 18 women in Lagos who dress in the style. And what I very much heard from them is um, that by beautifying a woman individually and all the more so in combination, the different elements of their dress, so the makeup, the heels, the weaves, the eyelashes and so on, that these, these beauty technologies or these normatively feminine beauty technologies promise to, to, to beautify, to feminize and thereby to armor and to bolster a woman. Um, they, they, in their talk, they suggested or they explained that the dress promises to prepare and support a woman to face the world by giving her self-confidence, by giving or imparting what one participant repeatedly referred to as that oomph. So the discursive logic here, I argue, was in short that beauty is power, um, but in this case, very much a power that works on and boosts the interior self. So I make an argument in the book about spectacularly, spectacular femininity functioning or promising to function as a form of psychic capital. Um, but according to the women I interviewed, not just any woman can, can do this look or can pull it off. To successfully achieve and embody the spectacularly feminine um, look or style is not easy, it's hard work. Um, it requires, uh, well, the, the style of dress is intricate, it's complex, it's expensive. I mean, I'd emphasize it, you know, it is very expensive, at least in the way that the women, my part particular participants were, were doing it. So for example, you know, they were wearing hair extensions of uh, several hundred or even over a thousand dollars. You know, so very kind of elite in that sense. So again, the, the, the dress is complex, not as anyone can do it. Um, according to the women, as I heard it, also as I saw it, it's also physically uh, difficult to embody. And even in their accounts, it's even psychically risky to embody. Um, so as such, I argue in the book that the, the style of dress calls for considerable material resources, technical and bodily skill, um, sheer labor, also time, uh, you know, so the time of sort of going to the salon, the time of um, doing this kind of intense makeup routine pretty much every morning when you wake up and so on. And also the style of dress calls for mental vigilance and calculation, particularly in terms of managing some of what they talked about as the kinds of risks of the style. So very quickly, an example of a risk was the risk, for example, of um, wearing uh, hair extensions, wearing weaves. You know, so they, they talked about the fact that if you wear a weave too much, there's a risk of that that beauty technology will damage your own hair. But in addition to that, they talked about a risk that if you, if you wear these technologies too much, not only might they impart a certain or cause a certain physical damage, but that you can also begin to lose yourself in them or begin to misrecognize yourself and so on because you've become so attached to them and so used to how you look with them. Also still on the question or on the theme of what it takes to do the style successfully, according to the women, one's disposition or one's attitude or mentality was, was key if not absolutely central. Um, so the women positioned themselves, and here they were sort of distinguishing themselves from other types of women who maybe look like them or dress in the same style, but they positioned themselves as women who very much choose the style for themselves. 
um, that, you know, so they, they very much said, I do it for me, it's just me, it's not for external gazes, not for other people's attention or approval, and certainly not for men. And, you know, certainly not for heterosexual attention, in, in uh, they claimed. So they positioned themselves, I argue, as knowing, as self-referential, as self-pleasing. There was one woman who said, you know, even if I'm not, even if I'm just at home, even if I'm not going out, I have to look good and I do it for myself because I like to see that self in the mirror. So again, it's not about how other people see me and whether or not they find me attractive. And then also echoing uh, common stereotypes that women who are highly invested in fashion and beauty, you know, echoing the, the stereotypes that those kinds of women are shallow or superficial and so on. Again, the women in my project sought to, um, I mean, in a sense, they affirm these stereotypes precisely by dissociating from them to say, you know, I'm not that type of woman. I'm not that type of girl. Yes, I might look like that because of my style, but actually I'm a different type. And so they, and here they really sought to, um, to assert that they are substantive women, that they're clever, they were all professional women or some of them were still uh, uh, in university, so pursuing higher education. So this idea that I'm not, I'm not silly, I'm not shallow, but rather I have depth, I have substance, I'm a professional woman, I'm an independent woman and so on. That was another thing that they very much argued that they, that they pay for their style themselves, they don't rely on men. So you know, very much a sort of assertion of this can-do independent femininity. Uh, who is powerful and again, empowered by the dress and also further self-empowering by in and through the dress. So putting all this together in, uh, in the book, I argue that both for what this style of dress promises and also for being the kinds of women able to do the style materially, but also attitudinally. And I think for the women, it was really much more attitudinally. They didn't really talk. I think it was the, the kind of material advantages they had that enabled them to do the style were kind of taken for granted. They didn't talk about that very much. Um, so I argue that they see themselves as not merely empowered, but also self-empowering, again, in and through this style. And in the book, I read all this, or I frame all this in terms of the concept of post-feminism. Hence, I argue that what they're fashioning is post-feminism, and hence the title of the book. So very briefly, in the few minutes I have left, I'll just say a few words about what I mean and understand by post-feminism. So the concept is somewhat disputed, or rather, there are different uh, uses and understandings of it. Um, in the work, I join a fairly large body of feminist media and cultural scholars um, to use uh, uh, the concept of post-feminism to, de to designate a popular, highly mediated, highly consumerist cultural formation and sensibility concerning the putative pastness and redundancy of feminism. So I argue that post-feminism is a temporal temporalizing sensibility that makes claims about the gendered times that are present for some kinds of women, not, certainly not all, in the Nigerian context, you know, the argument is very much about elite women. So again, post-feminism is making, making claims that a certain kind of time is present for some kinds of women. And this is a time in which feminism basically is passed or is redundant or is no longer needed um, because of prior feminist gains, gains and stages. So the idea that we're already sort of past a stage. Why as I argue in my book, how I frame it is this idea of being already empowered. So the idea that, you know, yes, some women need to be empowered or are still in need of empowerment, but not me. That was sort of what I heard from the participants. Um, Post-feminism is, I argue, or I would say is encapsulated by celebratory rhetorics of girl power. Uh, it declares women now empowered or again, already empowered, able to do and have and be and choose it all, including precisely to return to normatively feminine pursuits, such as the women in my book in terms of their dress and self-stylization. Um, so that's what I, understand by post-feminism. And so what part of what the book does and part of the contribution that I hope it makes, and I hope it, I try to sort of demonstrate this uh, through the empirical findings or through my analysis of them, um, is that I make the argument that it's possible to think and talk of post-feminism or of post-feminist culture or post-feminist self-stylization in the case of my participants in Africa. Um, so not just in the West. And I, you know, here I should say again, very briefly that when I began this project, the literature on post-feminism was very much about white, white privileged women in the in the global north. You know, so the kinds of the kinds of women that I uh, researched were certainly not seen or imagined in the literature as also potentially participating in this kind of, again, celebratory, highly consumerist culture. Um, so I, I make an argument for an understanding of post-feminism as transnational culture, as traveling across borders, uh, borders of nation and region, but also of feminist history as well. Um, and so with this, in, with this understanding of post-feminism, again, as transnational, what I try to then do in the book in the different chapters is to, and 
on the basis of the interviews and what participants said is to tease out and try and unpack the ways in which the culture takes root or maybe takes root is a bit strong, but you know, ha has a certain kind of localized grounding, how it comes to make sense and how it materializes locally. Um, and, and also in particular, in the case of my research participants, how it subjectifies the kinds of the promises that it, that this cultural formation makes to women and the kinds of discursive positions that are made available to them, uh, which they are invited to take up. And which certainly in terms of the interviews I heard to a degree that continues to sort of surprise me. I feel that I heard the women taking these uh, post-feminist discourses and subject positions up very strongly and very deeply. Um, okay, I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Amy. Okay, moving straight on to Kemi and more on the business of beauty and beauty diplomacy. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Roy, for inviting me. Uh, and again, I wanna echo what Sumi said about the discussion and just the synergies between our work uh, is really gratifying. So um, I just have a short um, PowerPoint, let's see, there we go. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna be talking about my book very briefly, uh, Beauty Diplomacy, Embodying an Emerging Nation, which was published by Stanford University Press. There is a discount if for those that might be interested in buying the book, um, if you use the discount on Stanford's um, webpage, Beauty 20, you get 20% off. So to, I'll just sketch out kind of the main argument that I make around uh, the key concept that I discuss in the book, beauty diplomacy, kind of sketch out what I mean by that term. And again, I'm uh, excited for the discussion that we'll have later. So um, what kind of got me interested in this topic was that I was um, visiting Nigeria and noticing that beauty pageants were really part of the urban landscape, specifically in Lagos, where I was spending a lot of time. So I found that uh, beauty pageants were both being attached to and advertised in the context of expected uh, examples for like, for example, uh, beauty and cosmetics. So I have an example here from uh, Miss Delta Soap to um, some other kind of more unexpected sites from promoting uh, industries like tourism to um, promoting other uh, industries like telecommunications. So here's an example from Miss Telcom 2009 and Miss Tourism Nigeria, and also used as a way of discussing um, uh, regional communities. So here's an example from Miss ECOWAS. And so I was interested in the ways in which beauty patents were really being used to, again, promote uh, not only uh, more expected uh, elements like beauty and cosmetics, but also these unexpected um, sites like other industries and also being used to promote particular social issues like peace. Uh, and so I was also, um, for my own interest, I was particularly interested in the ways in which pageants were being used to promote the nation. So this is an example from Miss Golden Jubilee, where the pageant was used to promote Nigeria's 50 years of independence. And so uh, in the book, I start off with um, the celebration around um, the Nigeria winning the Miss World, 2001 Miss World where um, for the very first time, a black woman of African descent won um, the, the Miss World pageant. And at that time it had been over 50 years and there had been no uh, winner from a black uh, African winner. And so there was a lot of celebration and optimism about her win. And uh, I talked about how particular politicians and government officials were uh, lauding her win as an example of kind of Nigeria's more, um, an optimism about Nigeria's um, uh, future trajectory. So during this time, Nigeria had only had um, around three years of democracy. And so there was a lot of kind of trepidation and anxiety about Nigeria's kind of national development. And so some of the quotes uh, of particular politicians during that time in terms of that win and kind of noting the significance of that win, one politician said, quote, this young and gifted lady symbolizes the new Nigeria and a democratic dividend. Her victory has now opened doors to our youths to compete with the best in the world. Another said, quote, that Nigeria has shifted from the dark days of military rule and the number one haven for corruption and bad governance to the number one in beauty uh, and intellect. 
And another talked about how Durego, uh, Aguami Durego, who was uh, that first Black African winner of Miss World, had um, become the greatest ambassador of Nigeria and of the continent and will have access to areas that even diplomats may not be able to reach. And so I talk about this example of Aguami Durego winning um, the Miss World pageant and a lot of the optimism around her win as being tied to Nigeria's national trajectory as a way of kind of making sense of and laying the foundation of this beauty diplomacy uh, narrative where um, the work that women do in the beauty pageant industry, particularly beauty queens, is seen as a way of promoting uh, the positive images of Nigeria as a country, especially in a context where kind of the global narrative around Nigeria is so negative. Uh, oftentimes, um, Nigeria is pre presented as a country that's kind of steeped in, in um, corruption, steeped in uh, conflict, and steeped in just a lot of um, uh, social problems that uh, mire the country. And so presenting kind of young, ambitious, uh, upperly mobile women as kind of the public face of um, promoting an image of the country that's a lot, a lot more positive. Uh, part of how I kind of situate the book is to talk around this larger uh, literature around gender and nation, specifically how uh, ideas about femininity and womanhood are used to promote uh, particular images and ideas around national development. And so this is a picture of um, when I was in Nigeria, I was in Kwara State and I ran ac across this billboard where this particular kind of rallying cry around no woman, no nation. Uh, was being depicted. And um, specifically this kind of no woman, no nation, which uh, has kind of emerged as this, as this particular political motto um, has been used as a way of talking about how women are central to kind of national development in the country. Uh, and I think um, this particular picture I found to be pretty ironic because um, the person that's at kind of the, you see the women in the background of the person who's at the front was the then uh, governor at the time. So I just, I thought it was interesting to see some of the con contradictions between um, the statement of women being kind of central to the nation, but you know, the, the male uh, governor is at the forefront. And that also speaks to some of the kind of contradictions that I found in my own book, which I'm happy to talk more about um, during the Q&A. So um, just to kind of share a more about how I think about this beauty diplomacy narrative, um, I want to share one of the quotes from uh, one of the contestants who kind of speaks to this larger idea of how um, their work as beauty queens, as beauty contestants was really important to, uh, again, wanting to present this, this more positive image of uh, Nigeria as a country. So she said, quote, number one, we're telling people that here in Africa, women are also given a sense of responsibility and pageantry has been able to say that. There's a whole lot of misconception about women in Africa and Nigeria. Pageantry has really done well. It has been able to not just help Nigeria, but her citizens. So thinking about how this beauty diplomacy narrative, which was really, um, really came kind of hand in hand in how beauty pageants are kind of seen and presented and perceived in, um, in, in Nigeria and kind of those that follow them. It was about the responsibility that these women, the contestants had to um, again, speaking to these positive angles and that there were also, it was deeply connected to ideas about gender as well. So there was something about how women in particular had this particular, uh, ha women in particular had this responsibility and they were able to tap into it in part because of some certain ideas around gendered responsibility and the work that they were seen as being able to, to kind of uniquely do because of their kind of gender and class position. So um, I kind of tie that, I tie that idea of beauty diplomacy to um, another concept of aesthetic capital. So specifically seeing the ways in which beauty queens had to present themselves as having uh, this total package. So it wasn't just about physical beauty and showing that they were attractive, uh, that they had specific attributes that was considered to be beautiful but they also had to present themselves as having particular internal dispositions that was seen as virtuous, as responsible, and that they were um, kind of upwardly mobile, and they were making uh, moves um, to better their own lives, but also to better kind of the, the lives and the um, uh, doing the work for kind of public social good as well. So there are ways in which they were able to kind of capitalize on this in terms of their own uh, careers and their own 
um, uh, ways in which they also wanted to be successful uh, in and of themselves, but they also had to show some side of, sort of civic commitment that they wanted to do the work to not only promote their own self, not, not only promote themselves, but also again do this work uh, that was considered in the the interests of the country and kind of the, the larger public good. So one of the ways in which they did this, um, in which the beauty queens did this, was by um, show, showing that they were different from other types of uh, work or labor where kind of beauty and aesthetics were at the forefront. And specifically, they would do this by comparing the work that they did to, to modeling. So modeling is another industry where kind of your, um, your physical beauty is the way in which you can make money, the way in which you book jobs. But they would talk about how the work that beauty queens, queens did was, was very different because they had to do all of this um, larger um, charity work and kind of be plugged into particular nonprofits, et cetera that really showed that they weren't just beautiful, but they were doing kind of a larger public good. Uh, so uh, one uh, quote that kind of illustrates some of the, the connections or some of the differences they saw between models and the work that they did was um, another beauty contestant who talked about how, you know, models are just hangers and they walk and they have that blank expression on their face. And they're just basically showing the clothes. They, they're not really doing anything. They walk, come out, walk, come out. And that's what they do. But pageantry is you. It's your beauty, intelligence, creativity, communication, showcasing you and what you've got. So again, there's a way of kind of showing that um, characterizing models as being kind of faceless or vapid or shallow, but that they were doing work that, yes, was showcasing, uh, showcasing themselves, showcasing their beauty and their in intelligence, but there was a lot, it was presented as something a lot deeper and that they were doing work that was considered to be um, important and significant. And again, this is a way of kind of um, elevating the work that they were doing, kind of speaking to some of the naysayers that might've been more uh, skeptical of uh, the, the skeptical of their kind of motivations for participating, but then also skeptical of the, the larger uh, kind of impact or consequences of the work that we're doing. Uh, and then this is another quote that kind of illustrates that where um, another beauty contestant was talking about how, you know, when they interview models, they're not really talking about Nigeria, they can't even speak good English. Uh, and in modeling, you don't have to talk. But in pageantry, you can't escape that you have to talk, the camera will always get you. So again, thinking about how this, there was a really emphasis on how beauty queens were expected to not only look good, but they had to speak well. Uh, and this was measured through things like grammar, uh, the accents that they had, and that they were kind of under this particular public scrutiny that, um, again, other uh, folks that might be seen as in similar types of industries or doing types, similar types of work was not under, were not uh, considered to be doing this kind of particular uh, form of aesthetic labor. Um, and I thought there was this, this was also interesting because many of the people that also made these comparisons were off were, you know, some of them were also pursuing kind of modeling careers on the side as well. So it wasn't as if um, they, it, they were, it wasn't as if they were completely denigrating models, but it was again, a way of kind of showing the difference between uh, modeling and um, participating in beauty pageants. Uh, and so then also speaking to the question of kind of empowerment. So oftentimes uh, this idea of having a voice, having a particular office that uh, beauty queens work to kind of to cultivate in terms of having a title and kind of leveraging that title uh, to do not only kind of charity work, but to also um, try to lobby politicians to kind of focus on particular social issues that they were passionate about. Um, Oftentimes the contestants would frame this as a way of them having a voice in the country in a context where they oftentimes felt that they wouldn't be heard. And so they would often use uh, particular understandings of having access to power as a way of kind of uh, thinking about that, um, that access that they were able to, to garner. So for example, one beauty contestant talked about how, first of all, it's a competition with probably thousands of girls around the nation. You feel, wow. This is a massive step it puts in your mind like I can do this in the course of it you get a lot of girls telling you how much they want to be like you how much you inspire them you actually have a voice. So it's empowering as a woman in Nigeria so again they would often kind of flip that script of stereotypes about beauty queens as being kind of um, insignificant 
as being shallow, as being disempowering, as a way of talking about, you know, I have this voice and this access that I find to be empowering. Um, at the same time, I argue that that access to power um, and this kind of idea of, of it being self-empowering for the beauty contestants are not, it's not, um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's um, understood in the context of particular structural constraints. So for example, oftentimes the beauty contestant would, would tell me that given kind of the public attention, they often had very high expectations around their access to economic capital. They had to dress in particular ways, expected to drive specific types of cars, et cetera. And that was in some ways kind of uh, was, was difficult because they oftentimes didn't always have the, the cash to back up those economic expectations. And they would also talk about kind of the public scrutiny that was um, that came with uh, you know some of the kind of their fame and notoriety. So they would be, you know, they wouldn't want to do things like take a, a a a public bus because if they were seen on a public bus, it was they could they ran the risk of being kind of splashed on the tabloid. So there are ways in which again this access to kind of power and mobility was truncated and constrained. And so that's kind of part of the arguments that I make around kind of gender and power in the book and thinking about how, um, you know, the ways in which kind of this access to beauty diplomacy gives the contestants some, again, semblance of mobility and, and access to social capital and, and social networks, but there always has to be kind of tempered around the ways in which they're constrained. Uh, so I'll just, I'll end there and um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that might come up. Uh, thanks so much, Kenny. Gosh, I can't tell you how much I'm bursting to read that book, and it'll only take a uh, hundred years to arrive here. I just wanted to say for those who might have joined late to please, please use either the chat function or the Q&A function to keep your questions coming. Unfortunately, because of the numbers we have, we can't uh, afford you an opportunity to ask your question, as in the case in some webinars. Uh, so if you could just write them down, that, that would be uh, super. Thanks so much. Okay, our final speaker, Jacqueline Bethel. Thank you, Sheila and also Kayo. And I'm really excited um, to be here today, especially with two amazing uh, scholars that whose work I really admire and whose work my own students have also read. And we've talked at length about these issues about uh, beauty politics um, and how various ideas about race, gender, and also, of course, class, we have to talk about class, shape these ideas about being feminine um, and being a um, ideal, women within African settings. Um, so I just thought that I would spend around 10 to 15 minutes or so laying out the main themes of my um, book, which was published by the University of Michigan Press in, um, in late 2019. And in, in, it is titled Gender, Separatist Politics and Embodied Nationalism in Cameroon. And the book focuses on two main themes. So the first one being gender and the second one being everyday nationalism. In many ways, the work embraces uh, the main goals of the Governing Intimacies Project, which is to really to explore how gender emerges in particular forms in post-colonial societies. And in my own work, I really wanted to highlight how every um, how women's everyday sort of ordinary actions were very much uh, politicized in Cameroon during the 1960s and in the early 1970s. I really wanted to highlight how these everyday actions can play a role in political movements that are often seen and remembered in history as having men at the forefront. And what I uncovered um, during the research process when I was in the archives, conducting oral interviews, uh, what I uncovered was that when we focus on women's everyday actions and connect that to ideas about politics, we can uncover many fascinating things about women and politics that perhaps we didn't originally start out looking for. And one of the things that I uncovered and was very surprised 
was that women's roles in political movements are not always radical and overt, meaning that women are not always going to be in your face, kicking down the doors with guns. And what I found was that women's roles can be conservative, more subtle, and to be very clear, still make a deep and lasting impact, which is the case for Cameroon. And the women that I focus on in this work are formally educated women, female political elites, and the wives of government officials. These women worked within patriarchal confines. So within male dominated spaces when trying to really achieve two multi-layered goals. The first was to advance women's social and political rights. And the second was to play a key role in this larger political movement, which I'll address in a few minutes. But I did want to be clear and emphasize that the women that I focus on did not label themselves as feminists. But I do maintain in my work that they engage with what some gender studies scholars call quote unquote feminist actions. So behaviors in which they supported women's advancement and equality in diverse areas of women's lives. I did want to point out that some of the uh, women um, whose children that I interviewed, a lot of times their children would actually say, my mother was a feminist, like, you know, reflecting on it now. Um, but I can't say that those women themselves in that time period identified themselves in that way. I do believe that many of the findings of, those, of this work resonate beyond Cameroon and to a global level. So really, in other words, the research findings might compel us, you know, challenge us, force us to ask, what are the diverse and visible and subtle ways that women have played key roles in political movements? So whether that be a separatist movement, so a movement that supports the separation of a particular group of people from a larger body based on diverse factors, or whether that be a secessionist movement, one in which a group of people favor formal withdrawal from membership of a political state. And Cameroon, I believe, becomes a nice case study where we can further examine this larger question and really analyze the intimate connections between gender and everyday nationalism. And women's efforts to play leading roles uh, particularly in political movements in Cameroon in the 60s and 70s, really began, I would say, after Cameroon achieved independence from European rule in the early 1960s. So Cameroon, um, being a West Central African country, was under the shadows of European rule, much like other countries in the global South in the 19th and 20th century. But unlike many of these countries in the global South that were under one Western or European rule, two European powers essentially ruled Cameroon at the same time. So from the early 1900s to the uh, mid 1900s, the French and the British. By 1961, both the British and French ruled regions of the country had gained independence. And both regions, once ruled separately by the British and the French united, in October 1961 and became a federal republic. And this is where I step in and say, okay, this is where we start to see major issues come to the forefront about ideas about nationalism. So by the end of 1961, Cameroon officially forms the Federal Republic of Cameroon. And this unified uh, country comprises of the English speaking West Cameroon states and the French speaking East Cameroon state. And each state essentially has its own government, laws, official language, they even drive on opposite sides of the, um, of the um, road. And because each state was um, essentially politically independent, I assert in, in my work that they each had their own ideas about national identity. Um, it, throughout the 1960s and until around the early 1970s when the Federal Republic is dissolved. 
And throughout the 1960s, what we start to see is the larger and more powerful Francophone state starts to start sort of this more aggressive stand uh, towards the Anglophone uh, state, which I argue causes anxiety among the Anglophone political elites and formerly educated urbanites. So essentially anxiety over um, Anglophone cultural values, national identity, and political power, which they really felt was at stake and, um, and rightfully so. And so what we start to see in the smaller uh, Anglophone or the English speaking regions is a lot of anxiety about cultural values and identity. And the main question of focus starts to be, first, just who are we as a people? Second, just who are we as an Anglophone nation? In other words, what is our specific national identity within this larger political state? And at this point, this is where my book makes historical interventions. And I specifically focus on how formally educated citizens in urban regions of the English speaking West Cameroon state uh, develop their own ideas about this Anglophone national identity. And I assert that women were essentially, they were critical to this political project. This, this political project could not take off with that woman being at the center. Um, and so women's everyday actions were really at the center of developing this idea of the strong Anglophone national identity in the 1960s and early 1970s. And as I was conducting research in the archives and interviewing women, I, I had this question at the back of my mind and I was asking myself, how did women access these political spaces? Um, and that was an eight year journey <laughs> to try to answer that. Um, so in an effort to answer these kind of questions, my book ultimately argued that formally educated women access social and political power by invoking embodied nationalism. Um, so this concept that I, I, I understand as being a type of nationalism in which identities can be embodied through performance, emotional expression, and visual representation through, for instance, food. So what you eat, dress, what you wear, and suitable conduct, how you even walk, do you talk too loud, do you smile too much or too little? But within the Cameroonian context, I assert that female educated political elite invoked embodied nationalism to bring visual representation and emotional or effective practices of ideal, Anglophone womanhood within urban settings. So how women feel, and, and this is one of the things I really love about Semi and um, Kemi's work in, in terms of how we're all looking at the at, uh, beauty, pol at beauty politics. It's not just about what you're wearing. It's also the internal psyche. How does one feel? Um, how does one connect their emotions to their clothing? And so, in my own work, by emphasizing this embodied nationalism, I, I soon realized that these um, political elites that I am focusing on implied that women's everyday patterns of behavior and, and comportment, the clothes that they wore, the foods that they cooked, their reframing from gossip, um, whether or not they followed appropriate mar marital behavior, such as not challenging their husband's male authority by chasing them in public or beating their husband's uh, mistresses. Um, they thought all of this might project the suitable Anglophone persona, especially in contrast to French speaking Cameroonian women like myself, because I am from the French speaking regions. Um, and I can tell you doing oral interviews was quite interesting. I would have people look at me in the eyes and say, French speaking women from Cameroon don't know how to cook and I'm clean. And I would find myself defending myself saying, I can cook and also clean. Um, and so these are a lot of the, 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 the issues that I explore um, in my book of over seven chapters. And the first half of the book, I really focus on women's political expressions, women's organizations, formal um, campaigns that really 
target how women behave. I mean, there's an anti-gossiping campaign, literally where women are being told, stop gossiping too much, focus on other uh, domestic chores. And what we see is how many of these women's organizations actually want to be part of male dominated political parties because they get financial benefits. And I think this speaks to one of the main issues that the Governing Intimacy Project wants to explore, which is whether to think of the state as either oppressor or savior of women. It complicates how we see women's relationship to the state, both local and national. And the second half of the book um, focuses on the political nature of women's everyday uh, actions. So um, their, their, their daily lives, their um, intimate uh, relations and so on. And, and, and one of the main things that I focus on is on clothing. And I, and I talk about in one of the um, chapters how clothing became part of this uh, larger national project. Um, and I specifically focus on slacks. Um, and there's been a lot of focus in, uh, in African gender studies on miniskirts and, and how um, there are a lot this this tensions between ideal womanhood and, and sexual loose, looseness and so on. But in my own work, I was fascinated to see how conversations about women in trousers and slacks unfolded in a very different um, way. And I think I will end there and I look forward to the robust Q&A. Right, fabulous. And let's get down to it because we've already got a, at least two or three questions, Kyle. Yeah, thank you so much, all the speakers like Srila. I can't wait to read the three books. It's absolutely fascinating uh, research. So we do have two questions at the moment. One was posted by Charmaine Pereira to Kimi. And Charmaine is asking regarding, so you say that beauty pageants were used to promote the nation. Uh, Charmaine is asking, in light of the riots following the Miss World pageant in Abuja and Kaduna in 2002, I'm wondering whether you address the sense in which beauty pageants point to divides within the nation on the basis of region and differently inflected interpretations of uncovered and covered women's bodies and sexuality on the basis of religion. So, you know, problematizing a little bit the idea of the beauty pageant in terms of region and religion. The other uh, question, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, should we do one by one or? I'll maybe pose the other question, which is for someone else, and then maybe uh, you can um, you can all chip in. So the the other question is from Francisco Miguel, and he's asking if the women you talk to, I, I guess that could be for all of you, really, uh, the women you talk to or the women you researched were perform performing a kind of self empowerment agency in the, the type that Sabat Mahmoud described in the book, The Politics of PT, PAT, and his meaning the kind of self-empowerment agency that inhabits the norm and is not against it. And if that is the case, what are the implications this strategy poses for the struggle of women in the global South? And I guess all of you kind of spoke about uh, women who are working within the system, within the norm. So what are the implications of that? So there's another question uh, that just popped out for uh, Simi by David. So he's saying the talk of a spectacular femininity reminds me of the Les Saps in Kinshasa, but these were men. So do we have different genders in parallel spectacles? This is quite an interesting question as well. So I guess we can take these three questions and then maybe do a second round later. I don't know who wants to start. I can start. Um, that was a great question. So I have a um, chapter in my book where I talk specifically about the Miss World um, protests and what happened um, in 2002, where I kind of spin out all of the different like 
some of the competing perspectives, specifically the ways in which women's bodies were, were framed by both um, those that were in support of the pageant and those that were opposed to the pageant. And so I talked specifically about how um, all of the different groups, though they had uh, opposing views about to what ex to, to whether the pageant should have even been, been held in Nigeria in the first place, they, um, they rely on kind of similar narratives of needing to protect women's bodies kind of symbolically as a way of justifying their stance to whether to what degree they supported or didn't support the pageant. So I definitely think that there are ways in which kind of women's bodies become this rhetorical tool for thinking about uh, kind of national, thinking about national perspectives and thinking about the ways in which um, national identities and kind of ideas about the nation are always going to be uh, contested and fraught. And so thinking about how that, that example kind of speaks to the ways in which some of the fault lines in Nigeria around region, around religion, around ethnicity, around different interpretations of culture and kind of the, the trajectory that Nigeria should, should or shouldn't take um, often gets kind of uh, debated through ideas about women's bodies. So that's kind of part of the argument that I make in that specific chapter. And um, yeah, that's another kind of angle in which I got really interested in this project because um, it was just a really fascinating case for the ways in which body politics kind of intersects with globalization and nationalism and thinking about the ways in which these are just these uh, very contested and fraught um, terrains of thinking about these larger uh, debates. So th thank you again for the question. Um, maybe if I may speak to Francisco's question. And uh, Francisco's question also kind of, uh, I think it's quite a useful question because it also, for me, it helps me articulate a question that I had for Jack or a comment perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, for Jacqueline. Um, so yeah, the question as to whether, sorry, let me just pull up the question again. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, I guess the question about what, what is the sort of the nature, I maybe we could even say the effects or the, the results of the kind of performance of agency and self-empowerment that the kinds of women, let's say in my project, were performing. And, I, and again, I think we could, and I think you could say also that, that the kinds of women that Jacqueline studies as well were performing, or in, in their case, advocating for other, for other women. Um, I mean, I think the answer to the question is, you know, so the question of, were they challenging the norm or inhabiting the norm? And I suppose, I mean, maybe it's a, I hope it's not an unsatisfactory answer, but the answer is, for me is a bit of both, basically. And I suppose that's where, I mean, I think my book, certainly I am very ambivalent about a lot of the things in, in the book and a lot of the things that I heard from the women. And again, to connect it to Jacqueline's work, as I was reading it, I and mean, Jacqueline, you often, you, you often sort of use this phrase of like progressive but conservative or something like that. You know, there's that tension where it, 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 it sort of seems like on the one hand, yes, you know, again, the women in my project, the women in your project, and even Kemi's project as well in a different kind of way. It's like pushing, pushing forward certain kinds of norms, certain kinds of ideas about women's rights and women's opportunities and so on. But at the same time, there's just this deep strain of conservatism as well. At which, and I suppose for me, this, this is where for me, feminism comes in. It's like, it's a lot of, a lot of these kind of positions, they're just not, they're not radical enough, I suggest I, is, is what I would say. You know, so the women in my book, yes, it was this, very much this idea of like, I can do whatever I want. I'm this self-pleasing subject. I'm not constrained by external influences and so on. So there's something quite assertive about it. Not, there was a certain pushing back against norms in Nigeria. You know, most of the women were unmarried and they were in their mid twenties to early thirties for the most part. And, you know, so there, there was something very much about sort of, I'm not just looking for a husband. I'm not just that type, you know, I'm not just following a certain kind of conventional and conservative um, route that's expected of me. But at the same time, what they were positing as an alternative to me or in my hearing and certainly in my analysis, again, it just wasn't particularly, yeah, it just didn't feel sufficient actually as, as a kind of feminist politics, including the idea that like beauty is power. Uh, I mean, obviously one wouldn't want to sort of, I mean, that's a, obviously it's a commonplace idea. One wouldn't want to just poo poo that kind of idea. If women do feel um, boosted or again, as one of the participants said, you know, that you get a certain oomph when you look in the mirror and you look a certain way that, I mean, that's, that's important and it's not, it's not unreal, but the idea then that, that that suffices as a kind of politics that for me is problematic. And in the book certainly is the, is the, 
really the kind of the heart of the critique that I make is that that's not enough. And just to say, I mean, I think this also speaks to the question, if I could just quickly make the links as well about Bob Risky. So again, the idea that this kind of high, highly individualized consumerist, putatively apolitical performance of self, on the one hand, it is very radical in the Nigerian context and even more globally, but again, there's a, but the disavowal of politics um, means that it has certain limitations, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Francisco's question is, is indeed a really um, in, in, in important question in terms of the fact that it really does highlight or really spotlights these tensions, right? Just like what, what um, Simi was um, talking about, that in a lot of these um, articulations about agency and how it's, it's connected to uh, 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 body politics and and even um, political structures themselves are, are really, um, uh, you know, reflect ideas about um, this tension between how much do how much do we want to push certain boundaries? Um, and 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 I really, as a historian, I, I thought it was really important to prioritize and to highlight how women at that time might have identified themselves, um, and and really try to not connect that too much to how I understood what feminism was today, um, and to also realize that. It may not be radical in terms of they're out, you know, on the street, you know, doing certain certain things, being really overt about it. They they are making changes nevertheless, you know, in a very subtle ways. It may not be um, fast, but but changes are being done. Um, what in, in my own work throughout the 1960s, what I see are these women's organizations, like I was saying earl earlier, choosing to affiliate themselves with male dominated parties. Um, if, if, you know, if we were having the same conversation, um, I, I would say in other contexts, um, perhaps women's or, or organizations may not want to be affiliated with male uh, dominated parties, but in my own work, they do because they get funding. They use that funding to train women to become politicians, to start um, sports organizations for women, and they're, and they're making changes. And I did want to add that one of the, um, there was a situation which I was, I was, I was presenting this work much, much earlier on. And someone in the Q&A said, these are not feminist actions because a person was, was understanding it as, this is not, you know, the bra burning sort of feminist that I envision in my mind, you know? And, and I really had to emphasize that we're talking about, idea, about feminist actions within African settings. And, and it very much unravels in different ways and also you have all these other external factors that shape that such as race so the women that i am uh, i am looking at are formally educated abroad when i say abroad i mean on the continent nigeria ghana in the uk in the us but in Oregon, I don't know why they're um, going there. There must be some sort of exchange program, but they're 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 highly educated women. So their ideas about feminist actions um, is very different than if we were looking at women from another um, uh, class or different social pos positioning. Um, but I just thought that in my own work, it was just really important to say that they may not look like. The feminists you might imagine, but very much in their own minds um, and, and, and in my own analysis, they were engaging in feminist actions. Thank you for the answers. So we have a few more questions. There is a question from Sean for Kemi. The question basically, um, asks for your position on the argument on whether or not beauty contests solicit women's conformity to Eurocentric standards of beauty. I guess that's a quite, um, especially in the, in the context that you mentioned of the Miss World, what is this relationship between race and beauty that, you know, if you can draw on, on and explore on that. And Sean has mentioned is, uh, specifically the issue of dark complexion and natural black hair. 
So if you can comment on those on those aspects. Um, and then there's another question by Bikaminga, who's a colleague of ours here at WITS. B is asking uh, to see me um, your thoughts on how a trans woman- I to that question already. Uh, not, probably not fully, but a little bit. Uh, right, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just gonna quickly summarize for, for the audience okay. in case you guys uh, couldn't see. But basically asking how a particular trans woman uh, that is uh, mentioned in the question, uh, Bobriski, I don't know if uh, Simidel is uh, familiar or not, but basically asking how um, she could be read within this post-feminist uh, framework. And then maybe Simi can explore a little bit the other aspects of, of the question, especially regarding expressions of uh, womanhood in terms of consumerism and materiality. And then I, I just want to also add a comment to that. When you were speaking about your interviews, I did interview uh, quite a few uh, trans women in Mozambique, and I found quite fascinating that what you described is very much the discourse that I heard as well in terms of beauty as a, a, an armor. And um, I think that's another fascinating point that maybe you can um, uh, comment on that. So I, I guess uh, you can. Oh, you're, you're muted. I, did I'm you sorry, Tyra, we lost you. Sorry, sorry. I was just saying that uh, you can answer to these two questions and then we'll see if there's another round later. Hi, uh, should we just add the last, I don't know if you can see the last question around fe on uh, feminism in, or by anonymous. Shall I just read it? So it just oh, yeah, says, sure. would it be possible would it be possible to characterize these kinds of feminism as uh, distinctly African? So if I can just tag on and abuse chair privileges, because I was just really interested in the, you know, the specter of feminism, right? That's haunting this conversation. And it got, it's come out a little more now in the discussion. And indeed of this, I sense that these subjects are, might be insufficiently, inadequately feminist, if at all, right? And in fact, I mean, Simi, whose work I actually know, I mean, they would be quite straightforwardly bad feminist subjects, right? And and I wondered, and, and this is this is obviously some, you know, a whole session that we have to do on rethinking feminism, because basically, you know, what 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 are the kind of affect or the uh, the expectations or that feminism evokes? You know, what, what is the specter of feminism that we are evoking when we are judging these subjects as being insufficiently uh, radical or bad, in, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, we obviously need to, I mean, the questions asking that, like, what is African feminism? But I think it's a broader question to think, well, you know, what is, what is the feminism that we, we or if not our subjects are speaking, are speaking back to, right? Yeah, There's I think another question on feminism and the <laughs> can everyone see it? But then you can just club your responses because I don't think there'll be time to do much more after this. So the question is, what does feminism as a pol to what extent does feminism as a politics emerging in the 60s, reanimated in the 90s, function as a kind of foil against which women in your studies can assert moral authority or membership uh, in a moral community? Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do think it's interesting in all of our cases, there's ways in which kind of access to power is, uh, I think as someone had already mentioned, is is, is constrained within a, like a system that's a normalized system. And in the ways in which they kind of talk about access to power is very much individualized. It's very much about this kind of self-empowerment route about there's something about me gaining access to particular forms of power whether that be through like, you know, access to particular moral authority and kind of being able to, to embody a particular sense of self that's seen to be, you know, virtuous or seen to be significant in the context of the country or elite as well. Um, maybe there is something about kind of the fact that all of us are also talking about, you know, women on the, on the whole, they're um, pretty privileged. 
And what does that mean in terms of access to, to power and kind of the forms of feminist politics which you engage in? I do, I do think it's problematic to not take at some kind of value the ways in which um, the women uh, th that I interviewed and maybe in, in other, I don't wanna speak for others, but to also see the ways in which they're also kind of characterizing and thinking about their access to power and realizing that, you know, all of us have access to constrained forms of power um, and thinking about what that means. Uh, I think the reference to, to Sabah Mahmoud's work is really helpful because there are ways of thinking about, again, agency that might not on its face be seen as resistant. And what, what do we make for what do we make of that in terms of, of power? What do we make of that in terms of particular forms of feminist politics? And I do think there's something to be said for how that allows us to kind of reimagine feminism outside of this kind of Western gaze. And what, what does that mean for us to kind of rethink some of these um, structures? Uh, I do want to share kind of an anecdote of when I was doing the research. Um, I was interested in uh, kind of referencing that 2002 uh, kind of uh, conflict around the Miss World pageant and hosting the Miss World pageant in Nigeria. I was interested in kind of delving more into if there was any kind of a Nigerian feminist response. Um, and I wasn't really able to kind of uh, unpack that angle, but I did go to one organization and kind of talk to a couple of members. And I was asking them, you know, to what degree you were kind of involved in either being a for or against um, having the pageant being held in Nigeria. And uh, again, this was an anecdote, but they shared with me that, you know, we weren't really, basically the gist of the conversation was like, we weren't really involved in that because that's not what we care about in this context. We care about getting access to material needs for kind of marginalized people. We care about water and food and shelter. And so us mounting kind of this protest around a beauty pageant is not something that we were really a concern of ours. And I think that was kind of really helpful for me because so much of, or a lot of kind of the, the history around kind of particularly like American feminism and also I think to some extent um, feminist history in the UK has been around like protesting these pageants as a way of showing you know this is about objectifying women this is about you know women don't get access to power etc and I thought that was it was interesting for her uh, the woman I spoke to, to to be kind of point me to that and say like okay we're not it's not as if she wasn't able to articulate a critique of to me because she was saying you know this is this is about the private commodification of women's bodies. Like she was able to articulate that to me fairly readily, um, but she was like, this is a private concern and we're, we're focused on these other kind of social issues. So that, that, that's kind of been a, an anecdote that's kind of stayed with me to kind of rethink, you know, some of the ways, and again, that we might conceptualize um, what feminism means in different contexts, et cetera, and what some of the, the take homes might be. Um, and then in response to the other question, so um, I definitely feel like the critique around like thinking about global pageants as being Eurocentric is uh, a fair one, because if we kind of look at, again, the winners over time, there are these certain kind of patterns that you see. Um, so even though like now, those that are considered to be the most competitive tend to be from the global south. So countries like Venezuela or other Latin American countries, increasingly countries like the Philippines, et cetera, are seen to be more competitive. Um, and they put a lot of kind of financial resources into supporting their pageants uh, to be able to be competitive at a Miss World or Miss Universe. Um, but there is that critique that even those that win at kind of these national levels in other countries in the global south tend to be lighter skinned, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and kind of fall into those Eurocentric standards. I think, I think sometimes it can be, um, sometimes it can be a little bit problematic um, to talk about Eurocentric standards or talk about African standards kind of wholesale because I think it kind of rarefies these beauty standards as if you can't find diversity within those um, beauty norms or within those standards. So sometimes I am critical of kind of talking about them, these beauty ideals as being wholesale because there are contradictions within them. So I'll talk briefly about um, in the context of Nigeria, um, them sending contestants like whether they be lighter skinned, darker skinned um, to these global competitions was, was more, I found that that was more strategic than um, I, I assumed. So they would often tell me that 
um, for example, having a darker skin contestant at particular pageants was more competitive because that's what they were considered that they were that these global pageants expected Nigerian contestants to be darker. And that was some kind of a head leg up because it made them more exotically beautiful. So it didn't kind of pan out kind of as universally being that only only like the lighter skin contestants um, won uh, or that it was more, it was thought of a lot more strategically in terms of like skin color in particular. Um, and I think just like, you know, it was recently like this last round where, you know, all of the major beauty competitions, uh, Miss Universe, Miss World, and then Miss USA, Miss America were all black women. Some of them had natural hair, et cetera. And there were ways in which that was kind of celebrated around, amongst um, some people as a way of showing that there were these beauty norms that were changing. Uh, again, to what degree that's actually happening. Maybe there's something about a particular global moment where this kind of celebration of Black beauty is being more elevated, but um, I think there is some recognition of that. And so again, I don't want to say it's a kind of a wholesale um, ideas that are going on, but I'll, I'll end there. I, I did want to add to what Camille was saying and sort of take us back to the 1960s and, 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 and in my chapter on beauty pageants, there very much is this awareness about this increasing global idea of, about what um, what uh, beauty norms are, not only for women, but for Black women. Um, and in my own work, you know, the audience um, you know, would literally say, we want someone who's dark skin with an Afro. <laughs> and if that person didn't win, people will be writing letters to their local officials and talk about um, pageants being rigged. Um, and so I think it's also important to know or to also talk about how, how, how participants beyond the contestants themselves are engaging in these conversations about black beauty and in the 60s they're also responding to what's going on among um, um, African Americans in the um, uh, uh, US and ideas about you know the black is beautiful movement and they're engaging in this and you see this sort of spilling out onto the um, uh, uh, beauty pageant stages in the 1960s. If, I don't know, is there time for, for a bit more or? Okay, so just a couple of things in response to some of the questions and comments. Um, so basically, so there was a question about, you know, is it, are these feminisms, well, even if we're, if we're calling them feminisms or not, are they distinctly African? So, I mean, I guess I would say it's certainly in my work, uh, no, in the sense that, you know, I, so as I said, I make an argument uh, for post-feminism as a transnational sensibility. I don't, I don't argue that it's in any way unique to Nigeria, but what I try to do in the work and again, through the women's, uh, talk in, uh, what, through what they said in the interviews was to show how a certain kind of circulating, uh, again, highly mediated, highly consumerist sensibility articulates with, with kind of local ideas and sensibilities on the ground. So maybe in that sense, forming something that is kind of distinctly Nigerian in the detail of it. But I think the broad logics uh, certainly are not unique to the uh, Nigerian or African context. Um, and then to speak to Bosse's question about, and I mean, I think Srila was also getting at this, this question of feminism as a kind of foil and feminism as uh, that there's a certain sort of standard against which perhaps we're um, judging or analyzing our, our data and our participants and so on. So, I mean, one thing I would say quickly, and I know it's, it's uh, these lines get blurred for me in, in my mind, certainly in my speaking about the work, I, hopefully the lines are a bit clearer in the book, but you know, for me, the critique in the book is not about the women as individual subjects, it's really about the kind of the cultural repertoires and the cultural and the discourse, the post-feminist discourse, and also the promises that post-feminism makes. And that's where that's where my critique is located, because I, I do argue that post-feminism is, is seductive. You know, this idea of like, you can have it all, you can be it all, you know, who, who would say no to that in a sense, right? It's seductive, it's glossy. Um, so, so the critique is not, oh, why would a woman take up that position? The critique is more that actually, you know, what, what, what is the position? What is on offer actually? My, my argument is that ultimately it's quite hollow. Um, and, also, and also that it's quite, it, it ends up being, and I hear this from the women um, in reference to their beauty practice, that it ends up being difficult, but also painful to inhabit and to embody. You know, to, to, again, to, to, to sort of uh, push oneself out into the world as this kind of, this again, this confident woman who can do it all, who can have it all, when in fact there are these very brute structures and logics that of, of course still remain that one runs into. Um, and part of the critique in the book is that, you know, I, I didn't hear this 
I mean, maybe this is something that could be explored, could have been explored a bit further, but that there was a sense in which the women, to my surprise, because they were highly educated, highly articulate women, they, they didn't have a certain language for sexism, actually, right? So because, because of, again, this sort of, I argue, buying into this idea of, yes, I can do it all, I'm already empowered, all I have to do is believe in myself, and so on, obviously a very kind of neoliberal discourse as well. And then, oh, there was this sexist experience I had at work. There was, there was like a kind of discursive gap, actually, to sort of make sense of that. And so again, that's where my critique is, and that for me is where feminism, not to say that feminism is perfect, whatever feminism, is of course there are multiple feminisms, but where feminism for me as 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 critique, and as uh, you know, I in the book I sort of end on a, I literally sort of draw on Sarah Ahmed and say you know that the book mounts a killjoy critique because post feminism is such a happy happy discourse, happy set of promises again about you know just just lean in, just dig deep, you can be whatever you want. The feminism that I'm interested in is 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 critical. That's you know it's asking questions about power actually, um, not least because the questions empirically speaking the questions are clear and they're present you know I don't think we can avoid them, and the final thing I'll just say in terms of also speaking to Boss's question about feminism as a foil so I mean feminism, the word feminism or the kind of the, the notion of the feminist didn't come up at all in my project. You know I, I say in the book there was literally one reference. And I mean, I also didn't use the word or present the project in that in those kinds of terms. There was one woman who said she's speaking about her eyebrows. She said, you know, I refuse to tweeze my eyebrows or you know do anything with my eyebrows. And she said it's kind of like a weird feminist thing. And then she sort of moved on. And that literally, in I can't remember how many minutes or hours of interviews, was the only time that the word feminism or anything in that in that uh, line was was ever kind of mentioned. So feminism is absent. I, I argue uh, as a discourse, but I think what, what is present, but it's also very implicit, is actually not really spoken, is this idea of women's empowerment. And I mean, I don't know if Charmaine is, is still here. Charmaine has written, Charmaine Pereira has written about this and, and others very much in the Nigerian context. And uh, uh, lots of other scholars have also written about this more broadly in the African, but also global Southern context. Again, this kind of, the distinction between women's empowerment as a discourse and as a set of practices and politics and the institutionalization and NGOization of those kinds of ideas, versus feminism, again, as politics and as critique. So I think that there was something about women's empowerment. You know, women's empowerment in Nigeria, but not only, we could say maybe in the developing world in general, is a grassroots thing. This kind of links a little, I think, to what Kemi was, was saying about, you know, Nigerian feminists saying they didn't get involved in, the, in this world, the protests. So the idea that, yes, we, yes, we need women's empowerment in Nigeria. Women need access to schooling. Girls need access to sanitary pads and so on and so forth, right? Those things are clear, they're obvious. Th that's not me, that's not my life in terms of the women I interview, right? So the idea that yes, other women need to be empowered, those other women over there, if that's what women's empowerment is or needs to be, I'm already post that, uh, posted in a, in a temp temporal sense, but also as a kind of material kind of position. You know, I'm a woman who, I don't need women's, I don't need Sorry, I'm speaking as my participants, but you know I, I, that that I I I'm educated, I'm upwardly mobile, I'm a professional, and so and I'm also super glam as well, and I do it myself, and I pay for it myself. I don't need women's empowerment, so that that was the foil. But again, it was very implicit; it wasn't said. Every now and then, it came through a bit explicitly, but it was mostly implicit that it's those other women elsewhere, and that is the argument. That's how post feminine the concept of post feminism works in my book, in a context in which we're not even really talking about feminism; we're talking about something else. Sharila, do we have, do I have time to address the last question about African feminism? Um, I was going to. Oh, sorry, I'm muted, go for it, yes. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. I was actually going to combine that question with um, Abisetta's George's uh, recent question in, when she asked, I'm also interested in how the women in your studies themselves analyze the spaces of power they're seeking to access. Do they have critiques of the power structures that they must engage or are they simply trying to, to negotiate a pathway in? Um, I really love that question because it, it, it also brings in the fold of, of the role that 
traditional women's organizations play, particularly in my own work. And so um, I, I don't want anybody in the audience leaving thinking, okay, so that you have these formal women's organizations connected to the male dominated states and, and that's it. We also have a play traditional women's organizations that have their own ideas about moral codes and the roles that women play in, uh, um, in essentially navigating um, those um, uh, uh, moral codes or actually dealing out punishment. Um, and so a lot of the women's organization that I was looking at, I saw that they were taking local ideas about women's political power um, in terms of uh, ideas about what does gender equality look like to them? What does feminist actions uh, uh, look like to, the, to, to them? But also continental and also ideas about um, gender beyond that. Um, and so if we look at the local spaces, um, you, you would sometimes see, I would see these, these contradictions in terms of how women should behave. And so you would have, for example, female journalists that would say, okay, women, um, you shouldn't be chastising your husband in public. You should not be beating him. You, you need to, you know, control yourself, you know? Um, and then, but then if let's say the husband didn't pay money to feed his family, they would then draw from traditional ideas from women's local women's organization about how to work that out. And you would literally have female journalists and then the next column say, okay, gather your friends, your neighbors, and you may all get together and chastise him, you know, and shame him for, for essentially deviating from uh, dominant ideas of uh, gender norms for men. Um, and so they're drawn from different um, spaces about um, feminist actions and how this unfolds. And what I found really fascinating um, in my work, particularly when I was looking at the conclusion and addressing the political landscape of Cameroon today, what I found was that actually the, the, the traditional women's organizations come to the forefront when there are serious political grievances and the women's organization that are connected to the state are sort of some, are sort of put to the side, um, perhaps because they're connected to the very state that these other women are, you know, protesting against. But 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 you see that the that there was a power shift. Um, because now you're seeing older women who are saying, okay, we have issues now. Um, we are not going to protest naked. We're not going to do all, all sorts of things. And their power, um, I, I, I realized at the end of my own work was um, becomes more at the, at the forefront of these political movements when there's serious, serious um, political gr grievances to address. And so I guess that's in one way in which African feminism is um, distinct, unique. Right, we've gone <laughs> a, a fair bit over time. So thank you so much for your patience, but our audience is still very much with us. Uh, but I'm afraid we can't, I think we've done a pretty good job, Cairo. I think we've got uh, all of the questions. I feel like Kai probably has a, a long list of his own that he, he wants to share. But yeah, we're almost going up to uh, half past five. So I think we better end now. So just, I mean, thank you so much. I think the discussion only suggests how much this is the beginning of a discussion, right? Like there's, the, it's, it's generative at so many different levels. I mean, rethinking gender as we've we've called the series is, uh, you know, a platform for rethinking the nation, for rethinking belonging, for rethinking, you know, race, class, um, affect, and ultimately now we've come to rethinking uh, feminism. And I, I just wanted to say as a final thing, it also, it always strikes me, of course, in my own work on Indian feminism, how much uh, our feminism still operate as a foil to Western feminisms, right? So the questions are always around, what is distinctive about African feminism? And in my context, it would be South Asian. And do you see what I mean? And I, I just think, I, I wonder if, if, if that puts us in this slightly awkward position where it maybe narrows the scope to really think about the multiplicity of our feminisms, right? And the 
the multiple political uh, and conflicting legacies in the way I think Jacqueline's historical work really brings forth and, and the multiple uh, you know, temporalities of the so-called neoliberal globalized moment, right? So I, I don't know, I feel like I, I don't wanna hear the question about you know, the African or the Asian feminism. I want to actually explode that a bit and to, and to say, well, you know, we also have multiple feminisms and they're all kind of difficult and complicated and they hail subjects and women attach in very women, uh, queer folk, whoever attach in very, very different and difficult ways. So Kayo, I think we just basically have to have a conversation about this. Uh, yeah. So thank you again. Um, for those who might have left, the recording will be over. And, and for those of you who are still here, let me just tell you that we'll be back on the 28th when we'll be talking to Rahul Rao uh, on his new book, Out of Time, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. It's It's, uh, been you know, amazingly received and it is an exceptional book. And Rahul will be in conversation with our own B Kaminga, who's here today. Thanks, B. So um, yeah, please put that into your diaries already, 28th um, of May and uh, sorry, April, and we look forward to seeing you there. Okay, and thank you so much to our speakers today.